Well, um, if you spend any time in Silicon Valley these days, there is a word that is just being said nonstop, and the word is cloud. It is the most popular prefix in the world, I think, right now, at least in the, the neck of the woods where I am right now. And you hear entrepreneurs betting their careers, venture capitalists betting lots of money on the latest cloud-based apps, the latest cloud-based music players, the latest cloud-based CRM tools, on and on and on. If you hear the word cloud and you read between the lines of how these conversations are going in the valley, what people are really saying is that your personal hard drive, that little spinning disk on your computer, is on the endangered species list. <laughs> that thing is, has the same trajectory as a floppy disk, if you remember those. Um, <laughs> Now, again, it's implicit. They're not out coming out saying it, but if you look at where the money's flowing, if you look at where the talent's going, there's an incredible bet on the web. And before we get into the web and we all geek out and I tell you a little bit about Google and where, what's going on there, uh, I wanna just start with an economist. So I went to OU, I studied economics there. There's an economist by the name of John Kenneth Galbraith. And a very smart guy, he passed away just a couple of years ago. Harvard trained advisor to multiple presidents. He wrote a book in the 50s called The Affluent Society. It had some really interesting economics in it, but no one really remembers that as much. They remember a phrase that he coined in chapter two of that rather slender volume. And the phrase was conventional wisdom. He created that word, that phrase. And it's something that Ted seeks to destroy every time it gathers, right? We wanna tear down the conventional wisdom. And what was interesting about Galbraith, just humor me here as I do a little uh, economics 101 here. Um, Galbraith thought that when you look at things in life, there's really two things a careful observer should look for. They should look for the events. And he, called, he talked about the march of events and where reality was going, what people were doing. And then he said, you should also be quick to follow that up and look for the ideas people use to interpret those events. And what was so penetrating about this chapter two in the affluent society as you read this, as you can see Galbraith sort of noticing often in human affairs, a gap begins to grow between reality, this march of events, and the ideas people use to interpret reality, the perception of reality. So if we take that as our backdrop, let's talk a little bit about the ideas people are using today when they do a very common experience when they go buy a computer. Now, I don't know if anyone's bought a computer recently. This is a grueling process. Um, whether you do it online or in a store, there's all kinds of gibberish you have to learn to make an informed decision as a consumer. I know because my parents or grandparents, whenever they're looking for a computer, they're quick to ask, and they're talking things about, you know, Josh, how many GBs should I get on my hard drive? <laughs> and you just sort of scratch your head. But we forced people, and more importantly, people have accepted the idea that when they go into a store, they get online, they're gonna order a computer, they're making these decisions. Should I get 500 GBs or 750 GBs or a terabyte, TBs, whatever they're gonna start calling that. And if you start to think about, those are the ideas people have about a computer. That's interesting, right? That's the conventional wisdom that you need bigger and bigger hard drives, more and more GBs to actually do what you do on your computer. But if you're at any kind of place in Silicon Valley right now, and even outside the valley, if you're plugged into what's happening and sort of how quick things are changing, what you're realizing is, like I said at the beginning, that hard drive is not that important. It's actually quite sort of obsolete in many ways because the march of events, what ordinary consumers like you, like me, are using our machines for is actually to get on the web. That's what we're doing. And I just wanna show you a few stats here because if you think about, the video was great for setting this up because if you think about the profound shift that we're seeing, if you've studied sort of this industry or followed along with this industry for any number of time, you know since about 2004, there's a clear line. Before 2004, there were tons of applications that were written that came on the CDs or you would download, you'd install on your computer and there'd be you know, shortcuts on your desktop to get to them. That all stopped in about 2004 in terms of getting to wide reaches of people. So Skype was one of the last big applications to get a million active users through this kind of old method. If you look at 2004 onward, what you see is a flurry of innovation, a flurry of activity on the web. Developers are developing for the web for a number of reasons. And as the proliferation of cheap laptops and smartphones and tablets begin to sort of take the US and other countries around the world by storm, being able to reach into the web actually provides so many advantages. So 
I just wanna show you some of the data. Again, these have been kind of clipped in the last few weeks um, and months. Tonight, when you go home in America, 20% of downstream internet traffic will be streamed on Netflix. Think about that. 20% of the pipe that's bringing internet into homes is being used to consume movies and TV online. Let's take YouTube. This is another one that's just shocking. Every minute, 35 hours of content is uploaded to YouTube. And at Google, we're having to revise this stat literally every quarter because it's just growing up and to the right. To put it in perspective, in movie terms, this is the equivalent, if we did this for a week of just letting YouTube you know, exist like it does, it's the equivalent of Hollywood releasing 176,000 movies in one week. Massive amounts of content, right? Now, it's not just about movies and TV and YouTube and dogs on skateboards and other things you see on YouTube. There's actually this whole social layer to the web that's developing. And this, again, a stat about Facebook. You know Facebook, you probably are on Facebook. 600 million users around the world, very close to that now. 30 billion pieces of content shared every month. These are pictures, these are links. It's a lot of poking going on on Facebook every month. <laughs> Now the other one, I had to revise this stat yesterday. This is Twitter, right? 200 million users. The number of tweets a year ago per day, 50 million. It's now 155 million. And again, as the web becomes more and more integrated into our lives, these sort of name, kind of name brand household names you guys have all heard of, they begin to just make sense. We begin to take this for granted. This is replacing the conventional wisdom that you need this big hard drive to do all this stuff. You can do this without a big hard drive. Now, I'm gonna tell you about a couple of other things that I think are really fascinating that are coming on that are sort of unconventional ways the web is sort of coming into our life. So there's a group, and Jeff mentioned it earlier in the early session about, called the Khan Academy. The Khan Academy, started by a young teacher, Saul Khan, a visionary, said, I want to use the web specifically video on the web, to educate the next generation of students. And if you haven't spent any time on this, go to your favorite search engine, search for Khan Academy, it'll come up right at the top. 2006, he started this, he's now recorded 2,100 videos about K through 12, math, chemistry, biology, any, any subject matter you can think of. And he's delivered 43 million lessons plus and counting. Gates Foundation, Google and others have just put written huge checks for this guy so he can expand his reach uh, with his content. So education, again, some really innovative stuff. And again, it all revolves around the web. This is one of my favorite projects to come out of Google in the last few months. We, uh, again, this is why Google is just a really fun place to work. One of my friends said, what if we could digitize every painting in the world and put it online so anyone could come to a free mu museum and come see it? Well, rather ambitious thought. Um, so, he set out with a small team of lawyers and some business development people, and they started talking to museums. They talked to the Met, the MoMA in New York, they talked to the National Gallery in London, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, the Uffizi in Florence, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, where this painting hangs. This is Van Gogh, the bedroom. And we managed to strike all these deals, brought in our Street View technology, wheeled these sort of trikes around the museums, taking pictures of what these museums look like, and we were able, in some of these instances, to get super high resolution pictures. You could never imagine. So if we zoom in on the pillow, this is, you can see, Van Gogh's brush strokes here. And again, this is just another example of how the web is starting to just pervade all of our lives and what we're doing. Now, there's a small team at Google who started thinking about this about 18 months ago. And they said, you know, so much of this stuff's moving online, all these stats and many others. What happened if we really rethought this sort of computing experience. Because you see, a lot of operating systems that you use at work, that you use at home, were actually written back in the early 90s, before the web was such a central part of our lives. And so we got to thinking. And if you follow that extension, is that logic to it, it's sort of full extreme. You get a computer that has nothing but a browser on it. Now, this again, very sort of unconventional and sort of disruptive, we think, because what we're essentially saying is, you know, all those entrepreneurs that are betting on the cloud, all those venture capitalists betting on the cloud, we think those guys are right. And the real innovation in the future, and even today you can see it, is moving in that direction. So if we be built a computer, if we wrote an operating system that simply got out of the way and got you as a user onto the web as fast as possible, that's really could be kind of cool. 
So we started thinking about it, and there's a team there that started writing up this code, and there's just a lot of interesting things that start to happen when you make that big assumption. The first one is that you get really fast computers. So I brought one along. We built this sort of prototype, and this is just reference hardware that we've sort of put together to run what we're calling Chrome OS, which is the Chrome web browser that Google's put out. And the OS obviously stands for operating system. And when you strip out all that code, all that stuff that runs in the background every time you start up your computer today, and you just focus on the code to get you online, instantly your computer speeds up. So the boot up times we're registering on this now are under 10 seconds, and we want to get it to just mere seconds from literally when you turn it on to when you're online. Now, another thing that's really great about this is when you talk to technical people, and a lot of the engineers at Google, they talk about this concept called Rust, which is kind of a funny idea to describe an operating system. But if you realize over time, you know how your computer slows down, it takes longer and longer to start up your computer, that is rust. That's stuff in the code, that's stuff you've downloaded over time that builds up and it gets really clunky. And it just makes the whole experience worse for you and slows you down. So we've designed an operating system with Chrome OS that's rust proof. That it is the, as fast as it is the first time you use it until like the thousandth time you turn it on. And what we're trying to do, again, around speed, because we realize that's what people really value with their devices, is when you open it back up, it's instantly back on. So it's just like a phone. When you turn on your phone out of your pocket, it's back on. We want, the, we want a computer to do the same thing. So it's really quick. It's zippy. We like that. The other thing we really like is we want to give people the same experience everywhere. And this is something, if you notice, um, some, Kindle does this extremely well. If you're reading on your Kindle and then you switch over and you start reading on your smartphone, it remembers what page you're on, which is pretty cool, right? So we want to create an actual experience where you have tabs open or bookmarks or themes or extensions on one machine, and then you can just walk over and log on to another machine and it's the same experience. You haven't missed a beat. So when you log in, it's personalized. It sort of knows what you want to do and what you are all about on the web. So as a way to sort of creatively illustrate this, we've actually destroyed a lot of these machines. We've done some fun things like launch, uh, launch them out of cannons and let trains run over them and things to illustrate to users that actually, if I took this machine and just busted it on the side of the stage, I could just pick up another one, I'd be out you know, a few hundred dollars, which wouldn't be good, but I could log back in and everything's there, right? Because nothing's stored on this, it's all stored on the web. So again, another sort of benefit you get when you create a cloud-based operating system. Another thing we realize is that a lot of people always wanna be connected. And this is another concept you see a lot in Silicon Valley right now. So the device we're putting together, again, just letting you in on some of the kind of early thinking here, there's obviously it'll be Wi-Fi and Ethernet, but we're also embedding in 3G. So anywhere your phone will work, your computer would work too, which is a very nice sort of thing. This is my favorite uh, aspect because this is the one that um, I like to describe, it passes the in-law test. So if, if you're someone that goes home for the holidays or if you live close to your parents um, or your in-laws, you often get questions about, I, I'm not sure if I should install this patch or this update or I think I got a virus or I think I have malware. And if you're like me, when I go home to see my parents at Christmas, there's a long list of things that you need to fix on the computer. And a lot of this stuff comes from from the idea that because you need a big hard drive and you need a big operating system to manage that big hard drive, you've got all these sort of bells and whistles and things that no one ever really uses, but they break all the time. And that causes a lot of problems, not only for my mom and dad, but for me by extension. Um, so what we've tried to do with this new operating system, again, built and optimized for the web, what we've said is every time it starts up, those 10 seconds right now, look for the latest updates. If there's any new up, you know, updates to the code, it'll automatically download them. So you've got the latest version running every time you start up. You never have to worry about updating things or you know, virus checkers and whatnot, because it just happens in the background. The other thing we do is that if there's anything that is tampered with, if you go to a website, sort of tries to infect your computer, we'll, we'll immediately sort of wipe that hard drive. And again, because the hard drive doesn't matter, the web is what matters here. We can bring in a new version, a clean version from the cloud, and you're off to, off to the races like nothing ever happened. So again, security built in. I think this will save a lot of times for sons and daughters at Christmas when they go home to their family. 
And then this is the part I was talking about. It's always fresh, it's always updating. And I think what, this is a part of the web that is incredibly beneficial. And this is not just Google, right? The web is a much bigger, bigger place. And when you go to Google or you go to Facebook or you go to Twitter or you go to Netflix, you never have to worry if you're going to get the latest version of the site, right? There's no install disk you have to put in to upgrade it. You always have the latest version. So that's what we're trying to do with the, the operating system as well. And then the final piece is creating a, a marketplace where developers, and again, this is really where a lot of innovation is happening. And um, if you get a chance to, to read any of the blogs on this, this stuff, every week there's just example after example of really exciting stuff that's coming on sort of this common platform of the web that, again, can be accessible from of any device there. So that's a little bit about where we think things are going um, and how Google's trying to position for it. And it's, it's interesting when you kind of take a, a five to 10 year view looking back, you wouldn't necessarily have, have come to this conclusion. And there's a lot of kind of naysayers in the market today that think this type of experience, is, it's not quite time yet. But what we found with a, a lot of research and a lot of the publicly available data that's out there is that there are millions of users millions and growing every day. This is the fastest growing segment of the population. For many of the members in the audience, if this doesn't seem relevant as much to you, talk to your kids about this. Um, because there are entire sort of generations of people coming online, not just in the US, but around the world, where this type of experience we think is gonna be a perfect fit for them. Now, it's interesting when you think about if we would have been alive thousands and thousands of years ago, there were heavily armored animals walking around the earth. They were dinosaurs. And if we were observing sort of the course of evolution, we had to make predictions on where things were gonna go. I think a lot of us probably would have said their armor plating is gonna get heavier and heavier. They're gonna be bigger and stronger. And the future actually had a trick up its sleeve, right? They threw on earth, in some form or fashion, these naked little human beings that were much, much smaller than dinosaurs but had much bigger brains. And those brains are what made the difference in terms of who was gonna master the planet over the next you know, millennia. And I think where we are in sort of the, the IT space and sort of where Silicon Valley is right now is we're in the middle of this sort of breaking point this sort of critical juncture where the conventional wisdom that says you need a bigger and bigger hard drive, we need terabytes of data on your local machine, your local laptop, I think that conventional wisdom is starting to fall out of step with reality. Because what we're seeing is another sharp bend in sort of the evolution of this space where the web, not the hard drive, is actually the core of the experience for most users. And in that way, I think we're gonna experience a new phase of innovation in the next few years that not only looks different, but it's different with a new kind of difference. And that's why we're trying to build an operating system that's built and optimized for the web. Thanks for your time.